And as promised today, we've got Select Board Chair Bernard Green running for re-election to the Select Board here on Brookline Interactive Group. Bernard, thanks for joining the show. Well, thank you for having me on, Tommy. Well, the really pleasure is you. indeed mine and by extension, Brookline Interactive Group. Uh, Bernard, we want to get into it and learn about uh, you and your accomplishments and your vision. But let's start. Uh, tell the voters where you're from. Tell them a little bit about you, uh, as you as you sort of made your way through your life. Okay. Well, let me let me start off with something that happened recently. I got vaccinated, uh, my second vaccination, and I, I mentioned that because I encourage everyone uh, to to get vaccinated when when they're able to, because it's critically important not just for Brookline but for our entire country and our entire globe that we reduce the incidence of this virus so that uh, we can get back to normal, have fun in the beautiful spring weather that we have. And with a okay. last name like Green, was that like a St. Patrick's Day special? You got a shot? I got a Patrick's shot Day? whenever St. Patrick's Day came up and I didn't have to wear green. I was green. <laughs> and it also reflects my environmental orientation. I'm, I'm green by, by name. And the E on the end is just, a, just an extra little thing. Little thing, but um, so you know, I lived in Brookline for uh, about twenty years now. Um, I've lived in a number of places. Uh, I came from a military family, uh, so we moved around a lot. I grew up as a uh, uh, as a um, teenager in Philadelphia. Uh, went to school in uh, at Swarthmore, which is outside of Philadelphia, and and I've lived uh, since uh, then in a number of uh, places, probably most uh, the large, uh, longest time in Cleveland, Ohio, and then Nashville, Tennessee. I've been a bond lawyer uh, for most of my um, uh, career. I'm retired now, but I uh, worked on a, a various uh, public uh, finance uh, projects in, in, uh, in Cleveland and here in um, Boston, where I was uh, general counsel to the Mass Clean Water Trust. Uh, in Tennessee, I was uh, investment counsel for uh, the state treasurer's de uh, department and their in in retirement fund. So that's a little background on, on my sort of professional um, credentials uh, for, whatever, for whatever that is worth. Uh, I've been in town government for about 16 years, uh, first as a member of town meeting for, for um, most of that time. And then uh, I was a uh, Pointed to the advisory committee, and then I ran for a select board. Um, I ran for select board because uh, people asked me to, uh, you know, consider it, uh, and uh, they thought that I could bring uh, a, a sort of temperament um, um, as well as you know a skill set that would be useful uh, for the town. So I, I agreed. I knew it was, it was going to be a hard job um, because I had been a member of a school board in Ohio. Uh, previously, and I know that public service can really be very, very difficult. But you know, I'm up to the task, and and I've decided uh, to not only uh, can you know do my six years so far, but also run for another three years. Uh, and people ask me, you know, why are you, why are you doing this? Because it's such a difficult job, and so uh, the environment in Brookline seems so toxic. But yeah, it, it is difficult. The environment can be toxic, but most people in this town. Uh, are very, uh, very, very respectful of uh, the hard work that uh, town officials do. And uh, it really makes me uh, feel good to be able to continue to represent them uh, as a member of the select board. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's the answer to that first question, Tommy. <laughs> now, now, thank you, Bernard. Now, the first five years you were in the select board, I know you were focused on school expansion and enrollment growth on climate issues, on a variety of, of issues that really were sort of consistent with town meeting and where the town had been looking. And over the last uh, you know, 12 or 13 months, every public official at every level has had their heads spun around by two uh, very different, perhaps in some ways interrelated issues, right? Issues surrounding Black Lives Matter, the murder of George Floyd, policing on one side, and then COVID on the other side. And, and uh, you know, that's the, that's the hand that, that you and other public officials have been dealt over the past year. So it's all right, I want to start by talking about policing, which is something that very much is um, at the hands of the select board as police commissioners. And I know that there were two committees formed to think through what policing in Brookline should be like. Can you tell us a little bit about 
the two committees, just a brief hint about how they came to be and what your role has been so far on that police conversation. Yeah, uh, let, let me start off by saying, I believe in creative tension. Uh, so we have two uh, committees set up. I, I set them up as chair of the select board. One, uh, reimagining policing, which uh, is focused on, you know, what are the big, big uh, issues in policing that can be solved by completely different uh, approaches to uh, public safety. Uh, the other was a reform committee that uh, is focused on, you know, how, how do we deal with immediate problems that we can fix um, in terms of improving uh, policing here in Brookline and continuing what is, has been a 30-year process of reimagining and rethinking policing here in Brookline. Now, it may seem that those two uh, groups um, were, were in conflict. One was to completely uh, change over a policing and the other to reform. But that conflict, to, to the extent it existed, uh, was really a creative tension. Uh, both of us had to think of policing, not from the standpoint of just our uh, focus, but how do we incorporate uh, the, the, the ideas and, and the um, discussions of the other side, of the other committee, of the other group uh, into our own thinking. Um, and that type of uh, creative tension, as I call it, uh, results in much better outcomes. For example, the uh, policing committee and the, and the um, uh, task force have uh, reached not agreement, but an, but an understanding that certain of our um, proposals are aligned. Um, you know, not perfectly aligned, but significantly aligned. And uh, you know, one of those, uh, one example is the police commissioner advisory committee that uh, my committee came up with. And uh, I've had conversations with uh, Raul Fernandez, uh, chair of the uh, task force on how, you know, they may buy into you know, the idea of uh, this way of uh, establishing a form of uh, civilian oversight of the police uh, by giving more powers and, and assistance to the select board, which who are the town's police commissioners and you know, are designed to be a uh, uh, police oversight uh, body. So, you know, we were able to uh, reach some agreement. I'm not, you know, we'll see how far it goes, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm very you know, satisfied that we've got um, come a, a significant difference, a uh, significant way towards um, resolving some of our differences in that regard. Another area is the area of uh, whether police should be doing uh, certain types of uh, activities in the area of, um, of mental health and substance use uh, cri uh, uh, crisis calls. Um, homelessness, et cetera. Uh, we, you know, both of our committees agree that to the extent in our, in, in our opinion, in my opinion, to the extent safe and appropriate, to the extent that we can provide uh, services that, you know, um, relieve uh, police of, of some of these uh, responsibilities, uh, that's uh, something that should be done. I mean, for example, mental health crisis calls uh, are very volatile situations many times. It's important to uh, make sure the police are there so that uh, their skills in de-escalation of uh, tense situations uh, and in Brookline, you know, all of our police, 100% are trained in, in uh, crisis intervention training. Um, you know, the police there can help de-escalate while at the same time uh, our social worker uh, in the police department and hopefully in the future, other social workers and other service providers can be available either on the scene or after the scene in order to provide uh, uh, social, uh, uh, social type supports as well as uh, follow-up services for um, the person having a crisis. Uh, we're also uh, talking about um, in, a, in a way that's aligned, um, looking at uh, you know, what, what types of uh, additional programming uh, or programs would be uh, useful here in uh, Brookline to uh, make that process easier. Uh, we, you know, we, my committee um, is proposing that uh, the town uh, work with the local um, uh, psychiatric service providers uh, to see if we can uh, open up some beds uh, for emergency uh, uh, purposes uh, when when someone you know is in a crisis and and needs to be somewhere other than where they were. Um, 
And now, you know, typically we'll go into the emergency room, uh, which is a very, very bad situation. Um, or if they're lucky, and if we're lucky, there will be beds available in, uh, in uh, Boston uh, or Needham. Not a great situation, so if we can pull uh, together something that uh, will provide those services here in Brookline, it'd be much better. The task force is, is, is doing something similar, but you know, significantly different, and that is uh, they want to consult with a group out of uh, Eugene, Oregon, uh, that was set up primarily to deal with the incredibly large homeless population uh, they have in that town, in that city, um, uh, called Cahoots. Um, now, you know, we think that uh, the, the uh, proposals, or we think that the, um, the uh, Cahoots program uh, is something that we already do here in Brookline. It's just that we need those additional uh, services that I mentioned you know, beds, you know, which is part of the CAHOOTS program, as well as follow-up services. So, um, you know, we, we, like, I guess to sort of summarize, yeah, we have two different committees that, you know, there's creative tension there. And I, I think the result has been uh, an alignment on certain key uh, areas, in certain key areas uh, to the benefit of the town. Now, another place where we've seen creativity and perhaps tension has been on environment and climate issues. Certainly in town meeting, uh, there have been a variety of proposals, some, you know, more of a lighter touch and others um, aggressive enough to get noted on national news. Right. And, um, you know, I think that it's, it's important enough to the community that it's worth sort of raising the general question, uh, you know, how do you approach environmental issues as a member of the select board, what's your vision from that seat yeah. uh, on environmental and climate issues? Okay. So as, as a member of the select board, my, my authority is limited to Brookline. So uh, to the extent that we can uh, make changes in Brookline, for example, the fossil fuel free uh, initiative that uh, we, we've uh, we're working on, um, that's great. Um, but you know, global climate change is a global problem. Uh, and I think we have to always think about it in global terms. And, you know, how is that relevant since Brookline can't solve, you know, problems over in India or, or, or elsewhere? It's relevant because we're in the midst, we, we exist in a, a community that is surrounded by incredible resources, scientists, engineers, and others who actually can be, uh, provide the, uh, the uh, um, uh, programs, projects, uh, uh, and other things that can solve uh, climate change on a global scale, or at least begin to address global the global aspect of this problem. So, you know, I always say that, you know, let's let's talk about what we can do locally, but also let's think globally and articulate that to to people uh, in the local institutions. You know, um, not just you know the Harvards and the BU's and all those big fancy ones, but uh, Ben Franklin Institute and other you know, smaller engineering uh, schools we have here um, to make sure that we motivate, we, we encourage uh, rising scientists to really think about the climate, global climate problem. And hopefully out of that uh, will come um, you know, some, real, some initiatives that can be uh, successful um, you know, or, or can actually deal with uh, this problem effectively. And I'm, I'm gonna bounce from there uh, to transportation, which certainly has climate implications, but also e implications on health and well-being, on the economy, uh, on connectedness and community. And certainly, um, it's not just people who uh, live in Brookline who use Brookline roads uh, right. and sidewalks or the, the Green Line and so forth. Um, so what are you thinking about? What, what can you imagine sort of the transportation evolution in the 2020s what are we how is brookline going to change our infrastructure uh, around transportation over the next decade yeah well i guess i'd look at it in a couple ways um first of all I, i'm really um I'm saddened that the governor as i understand uh, has uh, slashed uh, funding to mbta uh, by a significant amount um, I don't understand that, but you know, then you know, I, I haven't. I'm not. I'm not the expert in that area. But it sounds like a bad idea, just uh, intuitively. Um, 
you know, ultimately, my, in my opinion, tra public transportation, at least in the uh, inner urban areas of towns of cities like uh, Boston, uh, should be free and expanded because transportation is incredibly important to give people access to, to jobs and, and other things that may exist outside their local area. It has significant um, um, environmental uh, impacts if you uh, encourage people and, and enable people to take uh, public transportation instead of driving uh, to, to their jobs. I mean, that, that saves um, you know, or, or reduces uh, people on the road which has significant environmental impacts. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, that's one idea. It, it may be a radical idea, but it's, it makes a lot of sense and it even is cost effective if done properly. So, you know, I've heard some people talk about that. I hope that, you know, that, that idea gets some headwind or, or tailwind, whatever the metaphor is. Um, the, the other thing in terms of infrastructure, you know, we talk about, um, you know, where, where to build uh, housing in, in Brookline, mainly multifamily housing. And, you know, we have, uh, let's see, two corridors that really, we really should focus on in terms of uh, multifamily housing development. Um, and that's uh, Beacon Street and uh, Harvard Street. And why those streets? Um, pr yeah, actually, probably Washington too, uh, because the, what is it? I think 65 bus line goes up, up there. But uh, I think of Beacon Street and Harvard Street because you know, those are areas where it is practical, it is uh, possible for people to live and not have to use their cars to get to wherever they wanna go. I mean, the Green Line into Boston uh, is, a great, uh, has, is a great selling point for living in Brookline and uh, building housing along that corridor uh, would, would make a lot of sense. It would, get, it would make uh, or give people practical reasons to not uh, uh, drive their car into work or into Boston, whatever they're doing there. I think similarly, uh, Harvard Street, uh, re re remember, <laughs> I mean, the number 66 bus, which is a problematic bus, I, I, I agree. I mean, I know that from personal experience, but it goes from Nubian Square to Harvard Square. I mean, that, that is an incredible connection and it provides you know, and only Brookline has has uh, such a, a great connection. Uh, provides access to uh, both the uh, the educational um, uh, opportunity or educational facilities in Cambridge, um, as well as uh, you know opportunities in Nubian Square. And it also provides easy access to downtown Boston and connections. You know, fr from there. So those are, that's one you know, thing that I think is very important in terms of uh, infrastructural development, you know, developing both the uh, housing infrastructure as well as the uh, public infrastructure to make that possible. Well, and I'll add uh, for the 66 bus, a bus I also uh, ride from time to time that uh, we've seen in other communities uh, dedicated bus lanes to help the 66 move along more efficiently. And in fact, Brookline's Transportation Board is currently exploring uh, in conjunction with the MBTA, some dedicated bus lanes to really help that 66 zip along. It is one of the top 10 uh, most used buses uh, pre-COVID and uh, is overwhelmingly uh, ridden by women, uh, people of color, uh, folks getting to and from work in um, relatively low paying jobs. Uh, so it is an important backbone through our community. And I, and I wanna sort of loop back to race. Obviously police reform has some roots in conversation about race and conversations about transportation and housing also, at least in this region of the country, um, are closely connected with race. Um, I think that the conversation in Brookline around race is more complex. Um, you know, we just had the, the what certainly um, appears to me to be a hate crime in Atlanta. And that was around race as well, but not around black and brown people that was focused on Asian people. And so race in Brookline is complicated. And I just, you know, I want to sort of give you a microphone and say, hey, um, add some, you know, discuss some of this complexity a little bit, help the viewers uh, see the ways in which you can appreciate uh, just how interwoven and, and difficult uh, these sorts of conversations and problems are. 
Yeah. Well, you know, I have always said, and, and not just recently, I've always said that um, hate is indivisible. And I, it, with respect to the hate crimes against the uh, um, uh, Asian women in Atlanta, we have to see those hate crimes is not separate from uh, hate crimes against Black, Hispanic, uh, hate crimes against women, uh, you know, which is also a huge uh, problem in this country and, and reflected in Atlanta. Uh, it's, all the, it's all one problem, not, you know, indivisible, uh, not divided up uh, by, uh, you know, who, who, is, who is affected at one particular time. And, and we've got to, you know, provide support uh, to people on that basis. Um, and so, for example, in Atlanta, and, and we ought to do this in, in, um, here in Brookline, uh, even more so than we have, uh, Black organizers came out and said, your, uh, your uh, issues are our issues, and we're supporting you as, as an Asian community. Uh, and uh, just like in many times, the Asian community supports the Black community when, when we're faced with uh, um, a various situations. So that's one thing I would say. Yeah, it is a complicated uh, issue. Uh, it's it's uh, more made more complicated by the previous administration in Washington. Uh, you know, we we always have hatred. We have always had haters in this country. Uh, during normal times, they keep themselves under the rocks um, or in the swamps or wherever they hang out. But when a, a, a federal administration says it's okay to hate, matter of fact, you're my people then they feel emboldened to come out. And that's why we've had such a big increase in hate crimes uh, across the country, including here in Massachusetts, uh, since the, uh, since the, the uh, um, Trump administration. But also, you know, the hatred against Black people um, when, when Obama became president expressed itself in some of these hate groups coming out from under the rocks uh, dur during his administration. And uh, you know we, we have to you know recognize that um, you know hatred is always there, but but uh, we we have to fight against those uh, forces and those people who are sort of whipping it up, giving it uh, oxygen, giving fuel to the fire that they're creating. And you know we we have a problem right here in Massachusetts that we should think about and figure out some way of dealing with because some of the uh, uh, the worst uh, 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 white supremacist uh, hate groups involved in um, in the riot and insurrection on the Capitol on J January 6th, originated right here in, in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, so, you know, the problem is not a problem. We used to think that, you know, hate occurred in the South. Um, you know, having lived in the South, I can tell you that's not true. You know, hate is everywhere and uh, it, it's given oxygen when, when we allow um, uh, it, it to be given oxygen by either politicians or, or others. Um, yeah. Bernard, we've just got a minute left. So I'm going to remind folks uh, that you are Bernard Green. You are running for re-election to the select board and that you've been watching Brookline Interactive Group. But, uh, you know, I want to give you the last word. We've got about a minute, minute and a half. So anything else you want to talk about, anything you want to say directly to voters, maybe tell them your web page. Uh, now's your chance. Okay, my webpage is bernardgreen.com. I made it simple so that even I can remember it. Uh, the, I guess the thing I'd like to in, end with is to say that, uh, you know, despite uh, the, the, what seems to be a toxic atmosphere here in Brookline, Brookline is a wonderful community. And um, people in Brookline uh, are very uh, uh, respectful um, and uh, really interested in what's good for the community. We have some bad apples, you know, and, um, you know, we have to just, uh, you know, accept, accept that and not let it uh, distract us from our positive and, um, you know, uh, uh, approach to uh, the issues we face uh, here in Brookline. Um, people, uh, you know, yell at me sometimes at select board meetings, but then I get calls afterwards or, or an, an, at other times and people say, we appreciate the fact that uh, you know, you're working hard for the town and uh, we appreciate the fact that uh, uh, I, I don't go off the, the handle most of the, most of the times I have on occasion, but uh, I, which I acknowledge. But uh, people appreciate the fact that for the most part, um, you know, uh, we, we deal with uh, the sort of intense environment here in Brookline in a way that 
it does not give fuel to the um, to the um, uh, you know toxicity of, that that can exist. So, ladies and, again, and gentlemen, pardon me. Thank you for watching. You've been watching uh, TV on TV. I'm State Representative Tommy Vitolo. Brookline Interactive Group, of course, is our wonderful host. Bernard, thanks for being on the show, and I wish you the best of luck in the upcoming election. Thank you, Tommy. And I appreciate all that you do for the town. And, and of course, all that you do for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as a state representative. It's noticed and we appreciate it. Thank you, Bernard.